thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we're here to talk about suckler cows and how to set a, set a foundation for a profitable suckler herd. I'm Emma Steele and I work in the Knowledge Exchange team along with Sarah, who I have with me. Um, and we also have Paul and Seth with us too tonight, um, but I'll ask them to introduce themselves in more detail a little bit later. Um, first, I'm going to pass to Sarah to introduce the technology to you, tell you how to ask a question um, and how to make it all work best. So, Sarah. Thanks, Emma, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, so I'm just going to run through how you can ask uh, a question. Um, so if you go down to your navigation bar and click on the orange arrow, that will then expand the toolbar options. You then need to scroll down to where it says questions, click on the down arrow there and that will expand the question box and you can see there where you can type in your question um, and just make sure you press send. So throughout the evening I'll be interjecting and asking your questions um, to Seth and Paul throughout so please do make sure you, you keep sending those in. Um, just to check that the technology is working um, if you could just, Emma, if you could just move the slide on. Um, if you could just type into the question box um, what age you calve your heifers. So is it A, two years, B, two and a half, or C, three years? If you just quickly type that into the question box and then I can um, check that the technology is working. Ah, so that they're all coming in, thank you. Lovely, it's all working fine, Emma. Brilliant. Um, in the meantime, then, just as a bit of a reminder, please do ask questions throughout. Um, we won't wait till the end to do them. Um, Sarah will pop up whenever we have any questions coming through and we'll ask um, Paul and Seth whatever you want to be asked. Please also remain muted. If you do have a question to ask, use the question box as Sarah has just described. Um, we'll aim to finish earlier than nine depending on your questions. And the session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube probably by about the end of the week. So just as a quick agenda then to what we're gonna to cover tonight, we're gonna to start to talk about the theory behind breeding replacement heifers and the questions that you should be asking yourself and the thought processes you should be putting in place um, before you start breeding, breeding for your replacements. And then we'll look at the commercial application, how you do it on farm, does it work, um, things like that. And we'll eventually come to Seth and Paul for their top tips on, um, on how they would breed female replacements and the advice that they would give. So then, first, I'm going to pass, pass to Seth just to introduce yourself, who you are and where you come from, please, Seth. <coughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Emma, for uh, having us on this evening. So my name is Seth Waring. I am the business manager at the Stabilizer Cattle Company. Um, I, I've been in this role now for a couple of years. I feel very fortunate to be part of uh, a breed and, and, and be working with some fantastic producers that are, are delivering um, really good uh, returns to the soccer industry. Um, it, you know the the, the stabilizer itself if anybody doesn't know is a is a breed that's been developed through um crossbreeding to deliver the the best and most efficient suckler cow and i'm sure as we go through this evening uh, a lot of what we talk about will will be uh, applicable to, to what we do here at stabilizers um myself uh, to get to this point as well i've my background is in, in beef cattle nutrition i've also spent time working with retailers and processors uh, and hopefully, as we go through, you know, we'll, we'll draw on all of that and uh, we'll share some information with you uh, about not only the suckler cow, but also how that relates into today's modern uh, beef production systems. Brilliant. Thank you. And Paul, yourself? Yeah, good evening, everybody. And and, and um, Emma and um, Sarah, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this. Um, my name is Paul Westaway. We farm in um, Gloucestershire. We farm just over 200 acres here um, on either side of the M50. If you're ever going on the M50 between Junction 2 and 3 and you see lots of beef cows, they're probably ours. Um, we have um, a herd of Pedigree Aberdeen Angus and a per herd of um, Murray Greys here. We'll carve about 75 cows next year with ET, ETs as well as the, the purebreds. Um, half the farm is in level 2 country stewardship. 
so hence we're into um, grazing and, and that sort of environmental work and that suits the farm really well um, it's a Gloucestershire County Council tenancy so we're tenants of the council um, we've been here for 14 years um, and um, having a great fun spending our um, children's inheritance on cows so great to be here really looking forward to tonight it's not going to be deaf by PowerPoint it's going to be as interactive as we can be I'm delighted to be speaking along Seth. Seth actually in a former life used to do our nutrition here. So Seth and I know each other well and used to help me um, fill up the Keenan and uh, do that sort of stuff. So um, I'm sure we'll have a, a really good discussion. So thanks for the invitation. Brilliant, thank you. Sarah, have we got um, anything so far coming through? Is the tech all working? Yeah, the tech's all working, um, but we haven't got any questions so far. So we're all good to go. That's fine. So just a bit of scene setting then. If we're going to talk about breeding profitable um, replacement heifers to make profitable suckler cows, we probably need to know what makes them. So Seth, I'm going to come to you first. What makes a profitable suckler cow? So, you know, there's, there, I think there's a number of things that make a profitable suckler cow and it doesn't, it doesn't just all fall down to, to one thing in particular. But you know, you need a cow that is going to be in your herd and is going to stay in that herd for a long time. She needs a lot of traits that um, mean that you, you don't have to look after her very much. She should be able to look after herself. Uh, you don't have to get involved at many times of the year. Um, and, you know, you need a cow that perhaps doesn't, doesn't eat a lot, but is very good at producing a calf every year. Because I think the, the biggest uh, and the first, the most important thing for a suckler cow, she's got she's got one job to do, and that is to have a calf and to rear that calf through uh, until that calf is capable of of looking after herself. Um, and you know, for for me, that really starts. She should have a first calf when she's she's two, uh, and then she should have a calf every year on her birthday after that until you know she's either given you enough calves that she's paid for herself, or that her genetics are now outdated, and then you know she should be replaced in the herd so yeah. Paul what are your thoughts on that one yeah I mean, I mean I would concur on that and and I think that my other comment to that would be I mean we carve everything at two here as well um this but this is boys ground here so it, it we have we we can graze February to November here we've got we've got lots of pretty good forage we um we can grow red clover we grow lucerne here so we can we can get stuff to carving ease calving it too really easily here in fact sometimes I think um, um they're a bit fat as calving as two-year-olds which which worries me a little bit um absolutely I mean I would expect a cow here to have 10 calves if she's good enough to stay here um they, they and their, their their job is a to have a calf on their own um look after it and and really be upset when we wean it and if she's done that then for me she's she's done her job she's done her job um but I think it is horses for courses really I mean this is a really extensive grazing farm here and that's why the, the the natives fit really nice here that's where we have angus and murray graze here um i think in some other areas there are there are other breeds that are potentially suitable and we're not going to get into a, a breed debate tonight i'm sure but but it's it's I, th I think that i think the thing that we've learned really here over the last 14 years is is don't fight nature go with it and if you go with it and actually have the right cow for the system i think it, it seems to work really really well but but for us it's absolutely um we we would we would want our our, our calves wean per per 100 per cow rate at w well into the mid 90s and if not higher um the national average is 84 which is a bit disappointing still so um anything we can do to get that number up um i just can't you know the idea of of the average that 16 cows a year have a year off is 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 a bit of a worry for us as an industry um but over overall it's 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 about profit i mean we're tenant farmers we started with nothing and absolutely the cows that are still here are here because they because they generate profit and that's that's why they're still here yeah, so <laughs> sorry so what how much influence do you think genetics have on the things that you've both just spoken about then and to stop you talking over each other i'll just go seth first <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, look, you know, obviously, I, genetics have a have a massive part to play in all of that. You know, I appreciate that there are management systems to take into account as well, and and for most 
you know, for most environments, there is a, the right sort of genetics to have on your farm. And again, you know, like Paul says, depending on your land and your location, what the farm does well and what it doesn't do so well, that will determine what the, the breed is that you go with. But, but overall, the, you know, the, the genetics of what we're trying to have in a, in a suckler cow is sometimes slightly different to what we, what we have in, uh, you know, the end product that we're trying to sell. And I think for a long time in the UK, we focused on the, that end product and that end product being a, a big carcass that is delivered um, at a fairly young age. And we've tried to get the suckler cow to deliver that to us, whereas we forgot about the efficiencies in that suckler cow. So the genetics of the cow itself has a massive part to play. And, you know, when we're looking at the offspring, uh, that is also driven by genetics. So, you know, the, what you need for cow and what you need for the end product are sometimes two slightly different things. And, and, there's, and it's not necessarily always the case that you have to have the same genetics to do both. And do you think that's often overlooked? I, I think it has been overlooked, yeah, for, for the last, well, for, for a long time, actually, that, that we've, you know, we've, if you go back uh, a, a good few years, then a lot of the, um, the suckler cows came from the dairy herd. And actually, you know, it was a byproduct of the dairy herd and okay, she's got plenty of milk, is that is that good enough to be to make a, a you know a suckler cow that you want to keep on the farm for 10 years I, I don't think it is and so you know we started from that point and then we put um you know we, we were looking at terminal crosses going on to that to deliver uh, something in between but i think you know we need to we need to make sure that uh, we set goals of what we want to achieve with our suckler herd and we get the right genetics on the farm for the suckler herd and then we can we can use that what the what the ball's going on her we can use that as a separate subject and, and think about that slightly differently so i'm going to come back to that because i think that's a really good point we need to investigate further um paul did you have any thoughts on what seth just said well of course of course being pedigree breeders we're probably the wrong person to ask about genetics but um but um absolutely for me i mean it, it starts and ends with genetics really i mean i mean we can we can grow good forage here we have nice buildings we have great staff we can you know we can run a very good business here but actually the cows sort themselves out and, and it was interesting i'm just doing a bit of prep for this call tonight when we started in 2006 in those first couple of years we started with about 12 cow families there was about in the angus breed in particular there was about 12 families that we were really quite interested in we managed to get one of each generally buying older cows and stuff just to, just to get going Interestingly, if you come to the farm today, half the cows are from one cow family. And those cows all have one, they have several things in common. Number one, they're fertile, but they all have really good legs and feet. They have really good udders. They're fertile, they're medium size, and they just know how to hang around and um, stay out of trouble. And those are, that. that's what, and they've all got good genetics. They would all have pretty good EBVs. Um, as long as I don't cock it up and buy the wrong bull or do get that wrong, which we do occasionally, but not too often, fortunately. Um, and actually, interestingly, those really good cow families will stand a mistake of a bull sometimes as well. You want to get, get it right all the time. Um, and it's interesting how the natural selection here, they have actually kind of sorted themselves out a little bit, really. And um, that family is it. They're just they just never have anything wrong with them. They never see the hoof trimmer. Um, they all carve on their own pretty well. They just know how to live. And um, we're trying to run this place with minimal labor and we keep cows to keep us, not the other way around. And it's funny how they've managed to sort themselves out. And if you rank them, you rank that the, the, the herd, half the cows are from that pretty well, that cow family and probably 40% of our highest indexing cows are those cows as well. So the two do, do correlate. Brilliant. Seth, I'm going to come back to that point you made a minute ago, which was about having a clear strategy, whether that be a breeding policy, a replacement policy, whatever you want to call it. How important do you think having that clear strategy is and what should it detail? Yeah, I, you know, obviously having that clear goal is going to be a, a key one going forward because I think, you know, when we do these things, it takes a long time to see that come through in the herd. So from, from point of uh, service through to that, that heifer entering the herd with her first calf is three years, you know, and then we see it's not until she gets to three or four that we're seeing that true potential of a cow. So if you 
every year make a decision, oh, we're going to go down this route and we're going to focus on this. You do it for one year, you don't see it for three or four years, you, next year you make a different decision, and then you can end up with this, this whole hodgepodge of, of cows in your herd that don't necessarily do what you need them to do. So I think number one is setting out what do you want your cows to deliver for you, and, and uh, you know, Paul talked he touched on a lot of those points of actually what is it so you know for me it's it's first calf at two it's a calf every year after that you know we what you want to do is is try and make sure that you're not handling cows at, at calving so you know that they're, they're they spit calves out that the calf is lively and it's up and suckling so you're not having to to keep an eye on them all night um that when they when you when you have them bullying they're super fertile so you can have a, a nice short bullying period and that, that means a, sh a short carving period as well. So everything's happening at the same time. Um, and that when you're making your, your decisions and when she leaves the herd, it's not for bad feet or bad udders or bad temperament. You know, it's about genetic ability of that cow to pass it on. So, you know, all of those things, I think form should be forming part of your breeding plan going forward. So how far forward would you typically be thinking? For so, your breeding plan initially yeah so i would i would say always aim for the stars so write write down what you want to achieve i want a herd of cows that calve within nine weeks that all get back in calf next time that i don't have to have the foot trimmer out for that i don't have to suckle calves on and and you know we know to get there is is a long it, it can be a long process and you know realistically to get to that point you're probably talking you know, you see it in a first generation, but as you get closer to second and third generations, you see those benefits coming through more. It can be as long as 20 years to get to that point, but realistically, within you know two or three generations, you'll see the benefits coming through with three, four, five years in there. So, Paul, do you have something like that on farm then that you stick to? And how often do you, if you have got one, how often do you review it and look at it and question it? Yeah, I mean, we'd be similar. I mean, we're trying to carve at two. We're trying to carve everything within nine weeks. Um, clearly, we do we we do slip the bit. We slip on that as we're doing pretty extensive ET these days for health reasons. And I'm sure we'll maybe come back to that a little bit later. Trying to be as closed herd as we can. Um, the the th the other thing is, and, and I I give this. Uh, well, I do an awful lot of stuff um, at colleges helping young farmers get started because as a council farmer, you know, we're 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 in that world. I think the absolute key is find out what your customer wants and make it is the key and that should drive your your breeding goals so for example here within within two hours of this place there's a million dairy cows and our number one customer is a is a dairy farmer looking for an angus bull to sweep up his holstein or holstein cross jersey heifers after they've had a cross of sex semen that's that's what our number one customer wants and the, the, those customers, they want a uh, they want a bull that's probably 500 kilos at 400 days, um, has great big testicles, is semen tested, is high health vaccinated, and is ready to go. And that's what that's what we try and make. And that having no what knowing what we need, you can then work backwards. And that comes back to your to your suckler cow again. So I need that cow that calves as early in the block as she can, does a phenomenal job of rearing that calf, so two thirds of the work's done before it gets weaned. And also because you're selecting hard for fertility, the correlation between fertility of the cow and the, um, the her, her offspring, we all know about that. That's that's getting more proven all the time. And if you put that together, you 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 make what your customer wants, and and that's what that's what we've been doing for years. And delighted that we have many many repeat customers that that um, that seem to be quite happy what we do. So I think if you find out what your customer wants, I think the days of farmers. Um, waiting for somebody else to sell their product are probably are going to change and therefore so it doesn't matter if you're producing stores or light stores or finished cattle or pedigree bulls or crossers or whatever you want to do find out what your customer wants and then build your breeding program around that because there's so much data you can find almost anything you need brilliant sarah's popped up which means we have got questions or problems <laughs> questions it's all okay um seth i'll just come to you first um so there's just a question about um when does like weanling price and grade come into your category for a good cow so when is it important against those kind of maternal traits yeah so you know it all, i think it all depends on what you're trying to do with your herd as well so if you are um if you're wanting to breed your own replacements 
then obviously that that bears an important factor on it as well. But if you are if you're wanting to breed a, a, a different type of product, then then that comes into it. Now, I think for the you know the the weanling itself, irrespective of whether you're selling it as a weanling at six seven months, or whether you're selling it as a yearling, or whether you're taking it through to finish, that animal is also important. So the you know the cow itself, the shape of the cow, the the ability to flesh should all be taken into account. But as we said earlier, it does take two to tango. So you know you what if you know you should be breeding your cows to focus on the efficiency of the cow side of things, but then have the right sire going on to them to deliver that endpoint. And you know if if you're selling 100% of your animals, just like Paul said, look at what your market is. Is it, is, it, is it the store animal in the ring? So do you need that, that type of animal going? Do, is it gonna be going as a fat animal? Is it gonna be going um, on a premium scheme somewhere that needs a specific sire attached to it? These are all things that need to be taken into account. Um, and, and obviously we all wanna achieve the best price for whatever stock we're producing. And you know, again, depending on what you're trying to produce will depend which, which then direction you go down. But, you know the, the the cow itself is 50 percent of those genetics but she is the thing that you have to feed for 12 months of the year you have to look after for 12 months of the year and there's no point trying to get your you know the having a big animal an expensive animal to look after if you're then only going to be getting 85 calves per 100 animals put to the bull out of them yeah. yeah that's it you've got you've got to have the calf in the first place haven't you before you start looking at calf growth rates and yeah. And things and, like that. You know, I, I would rather have 96 live calves rather than 85 big calves. Yeah, yeah. Paul, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just, I mean, it's a great, whoever asked the question on wheelings, it's a great question because it's actually a really a good efficiency drive and it's a great way. We've talked about, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about maternal genetics. So, so we're really interested in wean, weaning coefficiency here. So when we wean calves here, I, I weigh the calf and we weigh mum, and I want to see what a percentage mum of of calf is. And that doesn't matter if you're pedigree or not pedigree or whatever breed you've got. Really, really, and it depends a little bit on season. And actually, this season might be quite an interesting one because we've got we've got dry ground conditions and lots of grass. So, so certainly those March and April calving cows here, those calves stay on their mums till November. I'd want them at least 50% weaning efficiency, i.e. if we've got a 700 kilo calf and she's been looking after it for six, seven months, I expect that calf to be half her body weight. And we rank our cows on that. And interestingly, go back to that cow family that I talked about earlier, that nearly half the cows are, they'll all be up there. And that's males and females, yeah. yeah? And that we select really hard for, um, the milk EBV, which we'll talk about later. We do rotational grazing, so that we try and get the stuff. So all that cow's got to do is is feed that calf properly and get pregnant again. And those sort of numbers are possible. Now, there are some people that will get way better performance than us using more creep. We use a little bit of creep, but that's a really nice way. So great for whoever asked the weanling question, great question, because anybody can measure that if you've got a set of scales, and that'll really help you rank your cows very quickly, yeah? Yeah, and um, I'm coming to you again, Paul. Um, so I think you have a few dairy cross cows, is that right? Yeah, so we, 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 we embark, we've actually just taken on, with the farms got bigger in the last year, we've taken on another 55 acres. Though, so to take our, take our numbers up, we, we had quite a few embryos in the tank and actually hunting around for our high health um, recipients is a, is a bit of a challenge for us. So we managed to, we managed to find some, some high health um, um, Angus cross Frisian heifers, and they were the same Yoni status, BVD, IBR, good TB status, um, proper vaccination. My vet was happy with them, so we brought them here, and they do a nice job. They do a nice job as recipients. So they get, um, they all, they get a, they get a go at an egg. Um, then they obviously then they sweep up with a bull afterwards, and we do we do keep them for those. And interestingly, they've got quite a nice market. The ones that don't hold embryos. In this part of the world, there's a really nice market for young car young farmers doing um, buying nice calves to to start and get into young farmers at a first place. And clearly, a, a beef cross out or one of those Holstein cross freezes is a really nice calf as a young yeah. farmer's project. Or obviously, some of the females we keep because obviously they'll be great recipients and they have our health status going forward. So I think dairy dairy crosses are fine in many beef enterprises. You compromise a little bit of confirmation, but you make hell up for more of it in milk. 
So it's just yeah. what suits your system. Yeah. And and have you looked at the weaning weights of the calves, obviously from the recipients and the calves that are, are brought up by their own mothers, just to see, because that would be quite interesting to see. Not not in enough numbers to be statistically right. significant, but my right. guess is my guess is there won't be there won't be there won't there won't be an awful lot in them. I mean, clearly these recipients are generally two year olds. So you're not you could be comparing them to sort of big four fifth calving cows, but they you can see how much milk they've got. And actually this year's are really interesting because this year's ET calves are a phenomenally nice bunch. Now I think they've been lucky it rained at just the right time. So the the grazing wedge in front of them has been really good. But I my gut feel is Sarah, they've done a pretty nice job, but would be too early okay. to say. Okay. No, that's fine. And then just again, just a couple of questions about your system, Paul. Um, do you use a bull or AI? Yep. So really good question. We're lucky with Angus's and with Murray's, we can get really good sex to male and female semen now. So everything here gets two crosses of AI and then swept up with a bull. Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and 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 the reason we do that is actually lots of we're already um there are some cows here that already have bulls booked out of them for next year. And therefore, we will make those cows with sex male semen, making what our customer wants. So you've got such a good choice of genetics now, sex male and female. And interestingly, in the last couple of years, we find our sex semen conception rates are on par with conventional. So it gives us such a nice choice. So everything gets two goes of AI and then and then bulls sweep up. OK. Um, and what do you do with the calves that don't fall into the nine week? Sorry, the cows that don't fall into that nine week calving system are they called from the herd or so we, one thing we will so i the only thing we will do because you carve it because we carve at two we do occasionally get some as so like a june born heifer that you're trying to drag back in carving at two so we do have a very small um october november group for two reasons a for some of those two-year-olds that carved right on right on two and to get them back in the block they would carve it probably under three and yeah. if they're working really hard, I'll potentially let them go to the October, November group and they can stay in there. The other thing about it is it does give me some bulls of different ages. So some people want some people want a, a, a yearling to a 50 month old bull in November, December time. Well, that's better produced by the October, November group. However, however, here, um, if they, they only get one go to move once and they never they don't get to move twice. Eh? So if they go yeah. from they, <laughs> they go to three year olds. And if you're a, if you're a four year old in that October, November group and you don't get in calf within eight weeks, I'm afraid you're going to pick stocks because um, the other thing we're very lucky here. Um, pick stocks have a phenomenal um, cull cow scheme for pedigree Angus. And huh. therefore, I'm afraid um, they're better off going and spending the money on something else. Yeah, that's it. And then just. Oh, sorry, Seth. Go on. I was going to say, I think you know that's an important important thing to consider at the moment. You know, the the cold cow price versus the the replacement heifer price. And if and if that cow's not delivering what you need it to do in terms of fertility, then perhaps yeah, definitely look at getting a shipped out. And and the cost of putting the heifer in is, is probably fairly close at the moment. And you you you're more than likely getting better genetics coming through in that next generation. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just my final question uh, before we move on. Um, what conception rates are you getting with the sex semen, Paul? Oh, we'd be we'd be up. We'd be up in the 60s, 60, 65, close to 70. But to be fair, they ought to be that high. So my, my background's dairy farming. Yeah, the, the, these cows are doing sod all. Eh? They calve in April. They're feeding a calf. If that calf's give it drinking 10 to 15 litres a day maximum, it's working pretty hard. She's on a rotational grazing system, getting moved every three days to eat the best grass. To be fair, the blooming thing ought to get in calf. Eh? There's no reason why she shouldn't. <laughs> um, this isn't this is this isn't a Holstein cow giving 55 kilos a day of milk and standing in a cubicle. They ought to get in calf. So we we'd be high 60s. We did we do get close to 70 occasionally, but but not not that high. High 60s, and I'm I'm quite happy with that. That works. Is that yeah. that you you if you run a conception rate at that level, you keep your calving block pretty tight. Yeah. That's it. And what, what body condition are they in? Um, well, to be fair, the number one challenge that we have here, and we still haven't, and that's one thing I haven't got right still today, is because we're selecting really hard for feed efficiency. We've got, we are, our dry cows will get too fat if we're not careful. So this year we've made a lot more hay. Hay what sort of went really out of vogue, didn't it? But we made a lot of hay and we're trying to, trying to hoik them back a bit. I, I would say that they were probably a half to a point too heavy on body condition this year after last year 
Right. And therefore, we're trying to hoik them, hoik them back. So, I mean, I, I don't want them carving up much over body condition three and hopefully probably a bit younger. I would say we'd have a few more than that. So I'm going to work much harder this year to try and get those dry cows back a little bit. Clearly, a long oat, open autumn really helps that. So, for example, if we this Indian summer we have carries on now, we'll probably wean calves in the next two, three, four weeks. And then those cows can potentially stay out till Christmas. If you do that, you cure your body condition score in one problem because you'll soon hoik some weight off them there. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And um, I've recently done a, a Nuffield scholarship looking at um, heifer replacements. And one of the things that I learned is it's important not to take too much weight off them near calving, because actually the egg for the next calf starts developing in that last trimester. So if we can keep them at, at least two and a half to three, then that will ensure you get co good conception rates the next time. Yeah, we'd be, we'd be the same, and, and we we and, and I've read some really interesting stuff on colostrum quality as well. And, and um, actually, yeah. I learned I learned a lot about colostrum quality from one of the big stabilizers guys, James Evans, was a, a really talked about that, and he was he's right. So I try and do our correction of body condition scoring before Christmas, not after. I think if they're yeah. too fit by Valentine's Day, you're going to have to manage them as they are. You you can't do it then, yeah, because of the egg quality the last semester of the calf, the colostrum that she's going to feed, blah, 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 blah. But you can do quite a bit on a spring calving herd in November and December. You can be a bit harder That's on them there. You can get half a point off them there, yeah. And I'm yeah. sure you'll both agree that the best way to minimise calving difficulties through EBVs, which leads us <laughs> oh. nicely on to the next <laughs> part of this, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you are, you are speaking a bit to the converted here, aren't you? But, but, but yeah. yes. <laughs> I'll hand back over to you, Emma. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So EBVs, yes, we've mentioned them now. Um, they obviously feature heavily in both your businesses. I'm going to come to Seth and then Paul. Seth, what are they? So an EBV is uh, it stands for an estimated breeding value. It it gives you an indication of how well that animal is going to pass on specific traits to its offspring. So it's not necessarily a measure of the animal you're looking at itself, but how well it can pass it on to the uh, onto the offspring. Now it it does take two to tango again. So you know to use EBVs, you need to look at both the, the dam and the sire, and the the offspring will get half of the uh, EBV from the dam and half the EBV from the sire and they record a, a number of traits uh, and every breed has you know a number of different ones there are a whole host of them that cover uh, everything from performance of the cow right the way through to performance of the offspring and yeah you're you're right Emma we we live and die by EBVs and, and that has that's how our breed has developed and, and the reason that we've made genetic gain so quick is that we focused very heavily on those EBVs now the, the, the big thing to remember is about EBVs is that E, it's, it is an estimated and it's no guarantee of what that, that animal will deliver, whether it's the, the dam or the sire. So, you know, when you're looking at EBVs, it is, it's, it's, it's key to, to making your right selection criteria. And again, when you're setting out with your goals in mind of what you want to achieve, use the correct EBVs of whatever goal you want to have a look at. Is this, is this a good time to share your slides, um, Seth? Yes, please. So uh, obviously now what, what we've got here is we've got two of the two of the different bulls that is that are in our stud at the moment, uh, and these are available for semen uh, collection, uh, semen uh, purchase. So the question really is, and you know, it's the same question that we all ask ourselves when we're looking at EBVs is which one of those two animals would you want to choose if you wanted to have a more maternal type animal and which one of those EBV or which one of those animals would you choose if you wanted a more terminal type animal uh, you know we've got two fantastic pictures there they're both they're both stabilizers um, and it's you know it, this is this is what most people do when they're out selecting a, a, a bull to go on their cows whether it's a, a physical bull or whether it's an AI um, a lot of it is done on, on pure looks. So if you can flick onto the next one, please. So what we've, what we've got here is now we've got uh, those two bulls and we've got the EBVs uh, with them. Now, both of these bulls for us are in the top 5% uh, of the breed. So they're both really good bulls, 
But what we're, what I've selected here is is one that is is more terminal type trait, uh, sire, and one is a more maternal type trait, sire. So I'm not going to go through all of these EBVs um, because we would be here all night discussing the pros and cons of them. But the way the way that our EBVs work, and I know it's the same with with Paul and his his Angus EBVs, is that anything that is on the right hand side of the scale is a positive and a good thing. Anything that is on the left hand side of the scale is a negative and a not so good thing. And the line that's straight down the middle is the average of the breed. So if we look at Nobleman, the, the bull that's on the left hand side, if we if we to have a look at his um, his traits, so that the top one is is birth weight. So if it's on the right hand side, he's, he's producing lighter calves. So you know that's that's a good thing for anybody is to have lighter calves, easier calving, less chance of any problems. We then need to start looking at, at what uh, what we want the, the calves to do. So for this for this cow uh, for the, for the sorry for nobleman the sire here, he his calves at weaning are going to be 20% uh, heavier than the average. When they get to yearling, they're going to be 25% heavier than the average. Um, now this this fella here he's got slightly uh, lower for milk and he is uh, slightly heavier for mature cow weight than the average. So looking at what, what he does here, he, he produces quite light calves that grow quickly, but they, they do keep growing a bit. Um, the rest of those, uh, with the other one that we just perhaps touch on is the scrotals, and that scrotal circumference gives an indication of fertility in the female cow as well. The rest of those EBVs are more focused on the terminal traits. The light blue are the carcass. The dark blue is, is how well they convert feed into uh, meat. And then the three bottom ones are our indexes. And I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll talk about indexes in, in a little bit. So, so for me, Nobleman is a more terminal type, uh, terminal type stabilizer. Light calves grow quickly, but keep growing with good, uh, good carcass traits. However, if we look at, uh, sorry, Emma, go on. It's all right. I was going to say, I've got two questions before we move on to Paul. One is, obviously, these are stabiliser figures and Paul's will be Angus figures. Are the principles the same regardless of breed? The, the, the principles are identical, you know, and, and some, of the, some of the metrics might be slightly different. You know, there, there could be, um, you know, uh, direct carbon ease and, and carving ease built into those, but use EBVs to give you an indication of how well those animals compare to the rest of that breed. Now, you can't use EBVs to compare Paul's Angus to the stabilizer, and Paul can't even use his EBVs to compare his Murray Grays against his Angus, because they're all against the population that they're recorded. But yes, the principle is exactly the same for any breed of animal. Uh, look for the, the traits that you want that are better. And are they just for pedigree breeders on high input systems? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, absolutely not. They, these, you know, they're, they're used a lot by pedigree breeders because, obviously, as a pedigree breeder, you want to produce the best of the best. You want to produce that top one percent that everybody wants to buy. However, EBVs can be used by absolutely everybody, and you know they perhaps should be used by everybody when selecting, uh, especially a sire. You know, when when that that one bull is potentially going to be serving 50 cows, if you use an AI, you could have one bull covering your whole herd. Now, you, you know, the the what this is 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 giving you an indication of how well that bull will pass those traits on. And if you're looking to be breeding replacements for yourself to go into the herd, those maternal traits that we highlighted in the yellow and green are exactly what you should be focusing on to drive that profitability of your herd going forward. Which leads very nicely on to Paul. Paul, shall we show um, what you're doing at your spot? Yeah, that that would be that would be great. So so what what we're what we're doing here is um, and this is particularly when we're we're selecting for for females really, and these are the things that that, that we use. And I'll talk about these. First thing to say is. Um, Carving use direct is standard here. We, we, we will not use a bull here that is not well above average for carving use direct for, for patently obvious reasons. Yeah, we did get persuaded about seven or eight years ago by a, an esteemed breeder to invest in a bull that was slightly below um, below average for carving ease, but they, they all carve OK. And I kind of got swept along with it. Suffice to say that bull and all his progeny are gone. They're a bloody disaster. So um, they so that's a, that the key bit for us. From the maternal traits, that the, the three or four that we're really 
paying a lot of attention for when we're looking for, for breeding females are there's two in indexes in the Anguses, a terminal index, which is by definition bulls that are um, for, for terminal use. So if you're breeding something that you're going to slaughter at 18 months of age or something like that, the terminal index is good. But the self-replacing index, by definition, is what it is. We're really interested in calving ease direct. That's the ability of the bull's progeny to carve at two years of age. So that's a really big trait for us. We're really interested in 200 day weight for a, for a very simple reason. If in a normal good grassy summer, those calves are on those cows for 200 days, and therefore I want the maximum genetic ability of that animal to grow well at that period, well, she's costing me the least money because mum's looking after her. So therefore, that's a big index for us. So the 200-day weight is a key one. We select for milk. milk. Milk is a fairly obvious one. That if your cows are milky, you have better calves. And we do select for IMF for two reasons. One, milk and intramuscular fat correlate. So if you select for one, you generally drive the other one as well. And absolutely, we do have to remember there is an end customer here. And um, nobody likes eating lean beef and intramuscular fat is good. So having that in there, it's, it's number five of the list, but we do we do look at it. And there are in both breeds, the Anguses and the Murray Graves, there are endless bulls that do these jobs. And then you can fine tune a little bit, really. So just on to the next slide. These are the three bulls that we're currently using for AI. Um, I took their names off to protect the innocent. And um, you can see all of them here have um, phenomenal carving ease direct figures. So your top 10%, top 1%, top 1% for that. They all have um, really nice 200 day growth. They've all got pretty good milk um, and they all have pretty good IMF. So those are the three bulls that we're, we're using now. And you can see those bulls are all available in AI so that they're, they're any, anybody can get those guys and they have all the, the traits that we're after. And just on to the next slide, these are three of my favorite cows. They will be. I'll get there. There we go. And actually, here are three <laughs> of my favorite cows. And shock horror, they have the same traits. And therefore, these three cows are all at home. These three cows are all pregnant. And they, they all have the same things, really. So once again, they have good carving use direct. Um, the, cat, the cow at the bottom, cow C, is actually 12 years old. So I'll forgive her, her growth figures a little bit because she's clearly been pushed on by, I think we have a great, great granddaughter of her here now but all her other traits are still really good. So she's here for, here for that reason. So you, you, can, you can look at these and you can get really confused, but actually the key with breeding is always find two or three things that you wanna work on and focus on those. Don't try and do everything at once. No, no, no bull is perfect. Um, my, my ambition is to see the perfect cow. I've never seen her yet. Um, I've certainly never seen the perfect bull. So work on the two or three things that you'd like to improve your herd on. And if you do that, you'll make rapid genetic progress. The guys that I come across that are in a bit of a muddle are trying to do too much. And actually, you you get nowhere. Work, Pick on the traits that you want to use. So is that kind of your, because that was going to be my next question, is that kind of your um, top tip, if you like, around looking at figures is if you're new, focusing on two things three things and focus on that until you get more confident rather than trying to tackle that whole list at once yeah exactly right and and it could and it could be and it's not on there because we don't have much linear data phenotypic linear data yet but that's all coming if it's udders, if it's udders and legs feet so if your number one problem if your cows cows are their, their udders go and find a bull but go and find his mother and make sure his mother's got a really good udder and look at his granny as well so that that might be one trait the moment you get, and we will have, we will have those phenotypic traits very soon. They're, they're coming all the time, and, and and it will become normal. And any of you from a dairy background on this call will be scratching your head saying, "Well, don't you know that?" Well, actually, in beef we don't, but it, it's coming. But absolutely, work on two or three things. As Seth said it earlier, you know, you know, concentrate what you want to do, work out what you're what you're trying to achieve, and and stick to it, and you'll you'll get there. Yeah. But if you try and do, if you try and buy Billy Wonderball, you'll end up with with fantasy land because you'll you won't you'll just end up improving little bits and so the 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 prop work out what the profit drivers are on your farm which we've talked about and then stick stick to those and you won't go too far wrong yeah mm -hmm. so where are all these figures where where do i find them so good question so for so for so interestingly um the angus breed the murray gray breed and the stabilizers are all on a system called Ambreed, which is an australian system so we you can compare by breed and by country to see work out what the base is. They're all available on the on the various websites. So you can find those if you go onto the Breed Society websites. 
There also is, which we're not going to talk, we're probably right at time, the AHDB carcass evaluation data is on the AHDB website, and that's really good, and we're starting to use that quite a bit as well. Um, the heritability is a bit lower, but it's really, really, really nice data. And actually, any any of that stuff is there. You can find them on the societies, and actually all, all the the breed societies of the bulls, you can you can actually even do a quick search and rank the traits. So if you're only interested in 400-day growth, you can search on that, and, and that search engine exists. And clearly, if you go to a sale to buy a bull and you can't see his EBVs, then buy another one. Yeah. You know, if you can't see it, don't buy it. You know, they, they, anybody selling a bull at a sale should be able to show you the figures. And if they can't, then don't buy the bloody thing yeah? because you, you don't know. You don't know. You could be buying anything. And you, you, what will happen is you get drawn like we all do to sales. You buy the big black one. And that's not really necessarily what you're after or the big white one or the big yellow one. Buy the one that's what you need for your cows, yeah. And, and breeders should be able to help you understand those as well, shouldn't they? So if you ask, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And to be honest with you, if a breeder won't explain the EBVs and a bull is trying to sell, you go and buy another one. I mean, I mean, they they should be able to explain that, yeah. Sarah, thank you. Um, so I'll go to to Seth with the, with this one. Um, are EBVs only available for pedigree cows? Yeah, um, they are only available for pedigree cows because the the to make up those the EBVs themselves, it needs a lot of calculation. So you can't just take an animal, measure its its mature weight, and expect to get an EBV for all of those other things. The EBVs work by knowing the relationship between the rest of the population, uh, and then uh, you need to have those correlations between those animals to have a to have a look uh, to to make sure that they're they're working properly. Uh, and those EBVs compare that animal against the rest of the herd. So you can't take you can't take the the measurements that, or the EBVs of a, a, a one breed and compare them against the next. Yeah. Can I ask it's a secondary right, question on that? Yeah. So if I have crossbred cows, which obviously a lot of the industry do, what's my next best step? Um, I can't select the mother on figures. What's my next best step? What's the next option? Well, you don't you don't necessarily have EBVs, but I'm pretty sure you will have some figures. You know, everybody's got a carving book. Everybody knows when she carved. Is she the first one in the carving? in the first three weeks is she in the second three weeks you know did she have a massive calf you all know those cows that you have to put your hands on every every year to pull the calf out so there are there is data that, that you probably already have and there is more data that you can collect um, to help you make those decisions so you know running the cows through the crush when it comes to weaning is a great way of measuring which are the big cows and those big cows are probably going to eat more food and and if one of your breeding goals is to then you know, reduce cow size, then that's what you can then look for in the EBVs. If your goal is to have more um, more cows in that first three weeks of your bulling period, use those cows that always carve in the first three weeks, use their daughters to come back into the herd. You know, so there are, there are things and there are numbers available that everybody can use. And when you combine those with the EBVs of the bull you're going to select to put on those, it can make a big difference and, and it can help you get to your suckler cow goals yeah and and and, I'll, and, I'll, and it's, a, it's a funny story but, but everybody on the call appreciate it my gra <laughs> my grandfather was it was a great great cowman and um and i went to a sale with him when i was about eight or nine years old and i and i didn't know what he was doing the first thing he did he said um paul we're going to go and find the herdsman okay fine and off we go we went and found the herdsman not the owner and we asked him for a list of the first 14 cows in the parlor and that's the one he bought yeah and there's a, there's a bit in that's exactly what Seth says. You you won't not everybody, not many, but have got lots of EBV data on cows. But you know which ones are there always car first. You know the ones that try and kill you. You know the ones that that are a bit hard to do. You know the ones you foot trim. So by definition, you can rank your cows on your own internal ranking. And if you collect the sires and you see Seth's got shout above the sire above his head, is actually collect that. And actually, we we have customers that come here looking for bulls. And we'll actually look at the size of their cows for them and have a bit of a look and say what those bull the size of their cows are good for. It's not terribly scientific, but it works. And then we make sure we pick something that will complement those. So if you know if you know who the last bull you used were, you're you're sort of halfway there because you've got you've got that data and the, the traits heritable. And then absolutely, you know, rank rank your cows on thingy. And actually, um, one thing I often say to people is show me the cow you like the most and show you the one you hate the most and tell me why. 
and that will usually tell you what your breeding goal should be because actually you want more of one and less of the other yeah that's it brilliant um so how important is having an index in keeping the traits balanced so i'll come to you first paul yeah so the the, over, the overall in the overall index is our composite so they are inevitably um everything pulled together so we pay attention to the individual indexes but i'm also really interested in the traits as well yeah so if you only want to use one thing because you just want it unbelievably simple if you, if you want if you're looking to produce females to go into your herd and um and and keep those as, as cows in your herd you should look at the self-replacing index or on the stabilizers it's got slightly slightly different names but but this is the same thing if you if you're going to look into have you got a herd of cows and you want to swell all the progeny as calves or heavy stores or finished cattle you maybe ought to be looking terminal and those indexes are very encompassing for that if you want to get deeper which is obviously what we do you don't have to go much deeper and you can then pick up milk or 200 day weight or 400 day weight depending exactly on what farming situation and what what drives profit on your farm yeah if you know what that is you can generally find what you want to do mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Seth, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, I think indexes are a really good tool for people to, to have their first access into looking at data and utilising those EBVs to to make those breeding decisions. Because, you know, when we flicked up the pictures, there's a lot of colours and they're all over the place. And, you know, I want this and I want that. And, and actually, some of those things are antagonistic. So by focusing on this one, you're actually going in the wrong direction of perhaps what your breeding goal is. So, you know, indexes are a great tool to give you one figure to look at. And when you're comparing, if, if you're if you're picking five bulls, uh, you want to pick one of those five bulls. Well, I want the one for the most maternal. You know, we use a, a pound weaning, just like the, 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 the self-replacing index. Uh, and we use a pound finishing. If we, if we want to be selling bigger, stronger stores, use those those indexes uh, to make those those decisions and it's and it's one number you have to focus on rather than bits of this and bits of that and, and like Paul says the further you get into it the more you will know what you want to achieve and that's when you start looking at individual EBVs and, and balancing those with the with the indexes. Yeah that's it and this next question is probably for you Emma um, oh. so we've got a, a pedigree breeder who would like to calculate EBVs um, for his herd how does he go about doing it? So the first thing he would need to do is uh, you'd need to know what breed it was. And then depending on the breed, I would suggest as a starting point, going to the breed society and asking who the provider is, purely because there are several different providers and asking the breed society is probably the quickest way. Um, so ask what the provider is, and then it'd be a case of setting on collecting a lot of the data, which um, Seth and Paul have spoken about. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Um, the next question is about milk, and it's actually one of my questions. Um, so when I was in America with my Nuffield, um, suckler breeders over there were deliberately only selecting cows for average milk um, because they were worried about its association with maintenance costs. I just wondered what your view was on it. Seth, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I think it all depends again on on what the other traits that are getting recorded of those animals are. You know, we're uh, you know we're talking from stabilizers. We're fortunate that we record feed efficiency, so we know actually how much um, feed the animals are going are intaking, and so therefore we can look at those animals that are good for feed efficiency, but also those ones that are good for milk. Now, if if you don't have that measure of feed, then yeah, it can be a, a good tool for looking at an average cow for milk is not going to then eat you out of house and home. Uh, during that, you know, during the dry period as well. But for, for us in the UK, I think, um, you know, don't worry too much about the, the milk thing. We, what we see perhaps more often is, um, you know, not perhaps not having enough milk than having too much. Yeah. And Paul, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, nature's pretty good at this for me, is that, that cows generally regulate themselves to what the calf will take, hey? So, so over time, it's like that. Where your milk EBV can get your mess. If you've got cows with pretty shocking udders and you keep selecting for high milk, they're going to probably get worse, and yeah. and therefore you're into that sort of pickle, really. To be honest with you, I I I select for as much milk as I can because to be fair, her job is to to get that calf, and actually the the incremental cost of kilos gain on that calf because mum gives me give, mum gives more milk, so calf's heavier at weaning. Um, if you worked it out, I'm sure it far outweighs 
the extra bit of grub that she eats it will be particularly when in a grazing situation yeah in in, in yeah. a more grain situation it, it could be different but for us it's whatever and to be fair the cows the cows regulate to the calf anyway yeah so um you know they won't they, you won't see cows running milk after six eight weeks of calving they've generally sorted themselves out by then yeah that's it and this question kind of relates to that paul um so what is your 200 day weight compared to your cow weight um i would i would be is? i would be close on the 700 kilos cows i'd want it to be close to half so we, we will have cows in a minute that um will be weaning six seven month old calves at 350 kilos yeah They'll, yeah. they'll be that they'll be that heavy yeah particularly on a grassy summer like this now the reason i don't preach um um i hope i don't preach anything but you don't preach you can get really you can really get your your you can really get caught out on weaning efficiency because it depends on season yeah but on a, on a year like this where generally we, we've been a bit skinny on grass a couple of times here but generally it's been it's been a pretty good year whenever it needed to rain it did we'll be up we'll be up at those sort of weights so clearly we're, we're after we're really after a a 500 kilo bull at 400 days is, is is our target market. Clearly, if that calf comes off the cow at 350 at 200 days, we're in really good shape. You know, we can actually yeah. make sure that bull doesn't get fat because, of course, the number one thing that kills fertility in young bulls is being too fat, fat yeah. and lazy. Yeah, I want, mm -hmm. I want, we, our customers want lean, mean, big testicled, fit bulls, not fat blobs. That are going to go run with heifers and lose weight for the first two months they want to be out there i'm pleased when they go down the tailboard and serve a heifer within two minutes that's what they're bred for now clearly if you have that weight early on then you can keep them in really really nice shape and they're easier to feed a bull a bull that comes off the cow at 180 200 kilos is going to have to be fed pretty hard through the winter to get there so by definition it costs me more and actually you might be a bit fat anyway because no matter how hard you try with a TMR, you're probably going to get there. So, so that's what that's what we're after, really. So, so we're not after big bulls here. My customers don't want bloody great bulls. They want that those heifers are generally 350, 400 kilos at service. They want a 500 kilo bull, but they don't want a 700 kilo bull. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And, any, and anybody, those customers that are crossing their anchors on on crossbreds, so Holstein cross jerseys or Holstein cross Swisses or three three way crosses. They want fit, big nutted bulls. That's what that's what the customer wants. Yeah, so, it's getting so, a bit personal. <laughs> well, you know, and actually, to be fair and and, and, and interesting. I, I have one guy that buys four bulls a year, and all he looks is at their testicles. And he's to you are, he's probably right. He's probably right. That's what they're there for. Yeah. Yeah, as Seth said, scrotal circumference relates to heifer fertility. So um, it sounds like I've opened a can of worms here, but um, I'll come to you first, Seth. It's again about milk. Um, would too much milk influence cow fertility? Do you know? Oh, I don't know about that one. I'll be honest, too much milk. I mean, you know, as Paul said, the the cow will only produce what that calf takes. So if, if she is then eating a lot, she's more than likely going to get put body condition back on, on herself. Now, that is the, the number one driver for me for a suckler cow is making sure that she's in the right body condition to, to be served. So if she is producing huge amounts of milk, focusing on all her efforts and putting milk into the calf, she's unlikely to get back in calf the next time. However, if she's producing a decent amount of milk, while also on a rising plan of nutrition, she's then gonna, you know, have a, a better, a better chance of getting back in calf. And so, yeah, I think, um, you know, using milk as a as a driver for fertility, I think, could be a little bit um, of a concern. You know, and again, so you know, I, I would look at perhaps some of the other EBVs to do that. Yeah, yeah and, and and I would add to that. So we we run our two year olds as a separate group to the cows. For, for for that reason and at the the way we've got around it is is absolutely we we select high for milk for the things we've talked about already but we do look after those two-year-olds so the two-year-olds and the in calf heifers usually run as one so they and actually in the grazing block they go first for for yeah. for completely yeah. obvious reasons we used to get um carving at two and, and running them as a big mob we just did whoever asked that question it's a great question by the way because if you're not careful you're carving at two and she, you've bred her to work hard and grazing's a bit tight or whatever, she then starts to lose weight, then your fertility will drop like a stone, yeah? So we'll, what we do is we run the in-calf heifers and the two-year-olds with their calves at foot as a group, 
and that seems to work really well for us. And on your rotational grazing, keep them at the front, and then they'll, they'll, you'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, I think that's you know that's a real big key important point is that you know a lot of people can are concerned about running uh, carving at two, but those carvers, those first carvers are your most important ones on the farm, and, and look after them, pay attention to those ones, give them everything they need, and then once they have that second calf, you won't see them again. You know, they'll yeah. stop into the herd and, and, and they'll just mix in. But that, after that first calf, look after them. And just going back to that, that point about milk and, and fertility, um, I think it was in America, there was a study that showed milk uh, negatively impacts on longevity. So maybe it does influence fertility somewhere um, along the line. Yeah, and, and, and in, in, in Holsteins, obviously, that, that, that's, that's well yeah. proven. The issue with that science in beef cows is I don't see many beef cows getting milked so the yield getting recorded accurately and that's the problem with it. So in theory it's possibly right but mm. actually actually all the people on the call if, if 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 at the end of the summer your cows are your cows have worked really hard you've got a phenomenally wean calf and in October November time you've you've got to put half a body condition score back on her in November December January that's easy. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Yeah. What's not easy is the fat, lazy pigs that don't rear, don't rear, don't rear nice calves that are losing you money. They're, yeah. they're no good to you, eh? They're no good to you. It's easy to put condition on. It's harder to take it off. But actually what drives profit is the weight of the thing when it comes off the cow, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Least, yeah. there could be, you know, there might be something with high milk yield and, and udders. So, you know, there could be that if they're constantly producing plenty of milk, then you might not have the longevity of the cow because of culling decisions around udders and teats. Yeah, that's that's a good point, Seth. Yeah, there's Thanks there's probably that. some correlation there, yeah. yeah. I mean, in, and any, anything here that we have to put the calf on the cow because its tits are too big are gone, yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not putting up with them. That's a disaster, eh? Because you're just breeding that genetic back in. they they got to go, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just uh, the final question before we move on. Um, do you think we should have a, a crossbreed analysis so we can pick the best genetics um, for the herd regardless of breed? Because obviously if you're wanting to choose a bull you have to go into the specific breed society web page. Do you think it'd be easier if it was all amalgamated? A bit like it would be, um, the Irish? It would, be, it would be easy if it's accurate. And actually, the Irish system is the only one that's close to being accurate, to be fair. And actually, if okay. you, you can get you can have all sorts of fun and games debate with that. Um, the bases aren't that different. Remember, remember we're going to remember that the, the, the graph, the graph 50 percent is the average of the calves. Actually, in Angus is it. So if you're looking at the Angus EBVs, it's the average of calves born in 2018. Yeah. The Murrays are the same. I think the stabilizers are the same as well as well. That's a pretty good base. That tells you where they are against average. And if you understand the breed specifics, you're probably there. So yeah, absolutely. I'd love crossbreed evaluation, but only if it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and actually, so so just to get our EBVs, we weigh everything at birth. We weigh them three times while they're grown. They get officially weighed by a recorder. They get back fat scanned. Um, they've got all the parent information. There's a lot of data going in there, and even then, and even then, as Seth said earlier, it's an estimated breeding value. It's not. This is not God, yeah. So absolutely, um, I think crossbreed evaluation would be fabulous, but only if it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, Seth, I do you have? No, no, no. I, I would completely agree with that. I think you know the the challenge is, and I understand if you're if you're a farmer and you want to go a certain way, you'd love to know how does this breed compare against this breed. And like, you know, in Ireland, they've got the ICBF database that allows them to put in, uh, you know, to find the best animal for whatever traits they want to do. And, that, you know, that does work well. I know in the States there are, you know, there's tools that you can compare one against the other. So you see where everybody's base is. Um, and over here, I think it's, it's, a little, it's a little more challenging. So, yeah, I would, I would, I would welcome it. Um, but with the proviso, it needs to be accurate. Yeah, and in Ireland, and, and, and in value. Ireland, all the top balls are Angus's anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I, I just I say it once. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> that is a black mark against your name, Paul. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, and just another question. Sorry, Emma. Just another question coming right. to you, Paul. Um, how do you select for feed efficiency? Is that something that you're doing? Yeah. 
So great question. So the, the only data we have, we do have it from genomic data. So there's been feed efficiency genomic data in Angus's for 10 years now. So certainly in the bulls, while it's not printed on the EBVs, you can usually find it. And if you can't find it, you find it on mum and you can find it on dad usually and mum, particularly in the American herd book. Um, I'd love to get it. And interesting, the Angus Society are now doing 50K genomic testing on all two-year-olds. So we're going to have a really good database of UK because at the minute we're having to take raw US data or Australian data or limited yeah. UK data, and it's 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 okay. I'd like to see the heritability a bit higher, um, and that's why I was really passionate when I was on AHDB board to get the beef feed efficiency money from Defra to get that work done because it's really it's it's another piece in the jigsaw to really help us that and, and there you go. I've given the Angus as a plug but all credit to the stabilizers guys they they are the leaders on those those traits they're a mile in front of everybody else and um, yeah. it pains me to say it but they are and so yeah. therefore we, we will catch up and um, so it's it's a bit scratty but you can find it it is there yeah yeah look I mean we've we've, we've now had three generations through our feed efficiency unit we've been feed efficiency testing for for eight years and you know what we're seeing is about a 12% reduction in feed for the same level of growth. So that's, you know, it's, it's been, it's a big driver in this, in the total profitability of a suckler herd, because uh, it's not only in the young stock that comes through, but the, the cows as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, essential as we go forward. And when we're competing on a, on a world market, feed efficiency is going to be a big driver for us as a uh, suckler producers. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. So I just want to quickly go back a little bit. Um, and we'd spoken about having different bulls for if you're producing beef and you're killing everything and different bulls for if you're um, producing female replacements. There'll be a lot of people that can't have multiple bulls running on farm or don't have access to AI or what's the compromise? So generally, if you're high for one, you're usually high for the other. So actually, if, you, if, you, if you're only going to use one bull, Actually, there's there's plenty of bulls that are actually good at both. And then, so I would select one that was equally good for terminal and self-replacing in the Angus breed. And then I might pick one more trait like calving ease direct maybe. And then I would do that. Keep it, keep it nice and nice and simple, yeah? You can't be, it's really hard to be super high on self-replacing index and, and really low on terminal because by definition, they've got some growth in them. So yeah. you, you've got them there. So I would go for a, a, a bit of a compromise and, there are plenty of bulls available that, that do both jobs nicely and then you can pick up maybe another trait would be my bit of advice yeah yeah uh, look, I'd, I'd completely agree with that is you know i think you know make make that decision on a good all-round bull and i think definitely don't try and and, and get the top one percent on your your maternal and your terminal indexes yeah. go for a, a good all-rounder you know if you're if you're buying anything in the top 20% of, of the breed, they're going to improve what you've got on farm anyway. So, you know, depending on your budget and how much you want to spend, but focus on getting a nice all round that gives you a right mix of what you want. And then if you need to, just like Paul said, uh, you know, then pick one other trait that you might need to focus on if that's, if that's what you want to go for. And would you have, um, not necessarily in your system, say if you were starting up again um, or yeah, starting up again from fresh, would you have a minimum percentile of index you would go for? So I'm not going for anything below top 50, top 25, top five, what would that be? Um, um, I'd, I'd, go, I'd go for as high as I can with my budget. Right. Dead simple, okay. dead simple. Yeah, you, you, you know that they, they are, they generally, they, they do rank on price, although very often the really good buys at the bull sales are actually not quite the superstars. They're the ones just under. And they're normally less than half the price, and actually they very often got other really good things go for them. But absolutely, you've got you've got a budget for your bull that your business will will stand. And absolutely, just go as as get as good as you can with the money you've got. But but don't think you have to go and spend twenty thousand quid because you don't. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know there there are really fabulous bulls around in that two to four gram market that are good buys that have great figures. They 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 do exist. You generally buy them young. And to be fair, you should always buy your bulls younger anyway. Get get them as young as you can you know, and make sure they're clean. You know, the whole bull hire thing is beyond me. You know, I mean, you put all this work into health and then, oh, he served a few before you add him. I mean, dear God, no. You know, get them clean and, and get your health status right and don't bring trouble in with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
And if you're buying in replacements, obviously you don't have control over how they're bred, but what things should you be asking for doing to make sure you're still getting that foundation? Well, for me, for me, so but the, when you're buying in replacements, actually even more higher than EBVs is health, eh? Well, get get to get get your vet to speak to the, the person's vet, understand that health status, understand what's going on. Um, that that's number one. And then then after that, I would I would ask what what are the animals sired by, and have a look at dad. And if dad's got the things you're after, you're in great shape. And if he hasn't, well, you might still buy them, but you know what you've got to correct quicker. But but yeah. I think I think you 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 when you're buying in replacements, I think your health's almost more important because um it it doesn't matter how how good EBVs are if they're dead they're dead yeah so so you've got you've got to you've got to get that bit right yeah absolutely yeah no I you know I, health is 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 number one because that's it you need to be making sure that you've got the animals coming in I'd also be looking at, at getting them getting them young and, and on the farm ready to go. You know, there's no point trying to move uh, an in-calf heifer or a, a cow with calf at foot or whatever that might be. But when you're buying in heifers, get them young, get them onto the farm a month before you need to bull them, get them settled in. But um, yeah, exactly like Paul says, uh, health is number one. Have a look at the the sire, see what he's he's been like, and and again, I would I would try and get as many from one sire as possible because then that makes your breeding decisions of what you're going to put on in on those girls quite simple you know and you can have you can then have one ball that goes on everything rather than having little bits of this and little bits of that uh, yeah. so where possible try and get a single sign and paul you mentioned about you don't have to spend 20 grand on a ball to get a good ball so that's one end of the spectrum the other end of the spectrum is a ball's just there to get a calf should be people be prepared to pay a bit more for semen and i'm not talking twenty thousand. Um, but a bit more for semen or a bull that has data, has figures to back it up. Should we be expecting yeah. to pay 1,500 quid, two grand for the, these good bulls? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, so so absolutely. So the, the, I, I can't, I've always tried to get my head around that the, 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 the what, if you pay 1,500 quid for a bull, you get what you get. If you pay two and a half grand, you get what you get. And as you go up through, yeah. And that bull will probably serve on average 30 or 40 animals a year. So you work it out, it's, it's beyond words yeah and you know when you i've got some mates around here that, that get all excited they get they go to market and they buy they buy a bull in some herd dispersal and he good looking chap and he yeah okay what do you know about him well not a lot really but he looked good at the sale well of course he did so that that's number one regarding semen i mean to be fair we're very lucky in this country we have semen companies tearing each other apart for semen market share um and there are some fabulous i mean we, we can there are some fabulous angus and murray gray bulls that you can buy for well under 10 pound a straw well under so the AI, the ai part of it works as well yeah i mean and you, they, they are they are really really good bulls yeah and um look that as long as genus and cogent and cmex and alter stay fighting with each other for market share the winner is the farmer and actually see it in sex semen as well what you can buy really high quality sex semen male and female now for a very sensible price particularly when the conception rates are as almost the same or as good as the conventional it, it's it's a it's an it's a it's a complete no-brainer yeah yeah and paul how do you evaluate what you're doing on farm the policies you put in place how do you evaluate whether they're actually working how much money we make sorry i mean we're te we're tenant farmers <laughs> when we started from nothing eh? it's profit it's, it's yeah. profit really um it's it's is have we got have we got money to reinvest um what what shape because we're obviously we're, we're we're tenant farmers we're getting ready we're a council farmer we will have to move on from here and rightly so because we need to clear off yeah. out the way and let somebody else have a go so we've got to have, make enough money to have the money in the bank to either have Paul's dream that waste it on cows and tractors or Kirsty's dream buy a nice house. And it depends, it, it, both are expensive, one more so than the other. And she's not on the call, by the way, we're okay. And um, so that that's really key. But we, 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 we've got some very simple simple parameters. I, 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 I need high 90s weaned calves per cow percentage is a real, if I've got that, everything else we, we can drive if i haven't got live calves i got trouble here yeah so so we we, we would want to be if i go below 95 percent wean calves off off cows i'd be really worried because we just wouldn't have enough to, you just haven't got enough to sell really so that that's a bit those are the, those are the two drivers yeah and 
once you've got calves on the floor, so you've all, their genetics are set, you've already got them, and to the point of choosing you're going to bull them, what else is going on in that period? Are you putting any other selection criteria in place? Um, yeah, that's the question. Are you putting any other selection criteria in place between birth and bulling? Yeah, so basically, so we, we'll, we'll still rank them We'll rank them on their EBVs and their and their raw raw growth data, their health data, all that sort of stuff. And we still do, and we st and actually here because we're doing ET. If if I'm not happy about one particular aspect of them, I'll put an embryo in them. They'll get a go at an embryo. And actually, that's quite good as well because occasionally we're not right. So you're not going to be right all the time. So you might have a heifer out of a really nice cow that for whatever reason isn't maybe what you think she's going to be. Pop an egg in her, and if you're wrong. You've still got her and she's got your health status yeah so you've already got her you haven't got to go and re re replace her um so we're, we're looking at those things all the time i'm pretty hard on temperament as well to be fair so anything that's got an attitude problem isn't going to have its own calf and actually anything that's got a real attitude isn't going to have an et calf either because um i've got two girls here i have no time for lunatics here yeah so so i don't mind them being the anguses in particular can be a bit maternal for the first 24 hours but after that, they better get over it. Yeah, there's only one boss here and it isn't them. And um, and if you select for temperament, temperament is highly heritable. You know, our, our, that cow family that we talked about again, they can be loonies for the first 12 hours, but they do get over it. Yeah, well, we've had a cow families here that after four days, they're still pouring the ground. Well, they don't live here anymore because they're no good to anybody, yeah. So I was gonna ask you some questions next about getting heifers to carve at two but i've got a feeling sarah's going to have ones that are better than mine and i think that's the reason she's popped up so uh, yeah, well, well, well no disrespect <laughs> Emma, actually, I'm, I'm sure the questions from the audience are better than yours emma i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is um what weight would you like a heifer calf to be at weaning if you were hoping to carve at two years of age uh, so I'll come Mini. to you first, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, I'd want I'd want I'd want them at 280 to 320 minimum, and ideally a bit more. Yeah, right, I want to. Seth... You want to be you want to be carving those heifers at 600 kilos, and probably a little bit more if I can at two. That's actually quite easy to do. So that that's what we find. They don't need to be any heavier than that. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. what was your mature weight, Paul? Well, it depends, really. So, okay. and, we're, and I'm sure somebody asked a question about showing in a minute. So actually. <laughs> My, in my view, all our best cows are about 700 to 750 kilos. Yeah, that that's what well, that's my okay. ideal cow is. That's where she is. Um, we do have some bigger than that, but they're doing a different job, and I'm sure that might come up later because it usually does. Yeah, because of course I'm a, I'm a complete hypocrite because we do showing as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And Seth. So for, so for was it the weaning weight, Sarah, or was it the? the it was the weaning the weight, yes. The weaning weight, yeah. So, so for me, again, it depends on how long she's 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 on her she's on her mother for. But you know, they need to be coming in two, and I'm talking about a seven month weaning, so two to two twenty coming in uh, into that autumn period, having a nice steady growth. And and if we get the, you know, if we get those genetic right, we shouldn't actually have to feed any concentrates to those females at all. You know. She needs to be about 340, 360 at bulling. Uh, for, for me, is at 15 months old, and then that will that will you know that will turn into cover first down just over 500 kilos with a mature weight of being just over 600 kilos. And, and yeah, yeah. And that, can, that, you... that's the, that, that's the difference for for Angus's. Our cows aren't that big, but we'd still be 150 kilos mature weight higher than the stabilizers today. Um, my gut feel is the optimum is somewhere between where Seth and I am is my gut feel. But what we have at the minute, those 750 kilo cows seem to fit that system, this system on this farm, on the sandy ground, extended grazing, and they seem to fit. We have had a few smaller and I wonder just that we're working them a bit too hard maybe, but I, I watch the stabilize and mature cow weight with interest. I think it's really interesting, yeah. 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 No, great. And I think, you know, the industry recommendation is that they weigh about 65% at breeding. Um, so that's something something to go on. Um, and then again, another question relating to two-year-old calving. Um, Paul, what percentage of your first-time two-year-old calvers are caesarean? None. Why, why would you do caesareans with Anguses, yeah? <laughs> well, well, sorry. With any breed. Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm not. I'm not going to get into an appraise. Um, we've done one cesarean here in in nine years, 
and actually in my view the vet was a coward and we should have pulled it okay and That's and it. how do you prevent those calving difficulties of those young heifers um select for calving yeast collect for calving yeast direct and manage manage your cows in the last three months of pregnancy and yeah. breed for it yeah yeah, do you have absolutely. any additional advice, Seth? Yeah, I, yeah, you know, I, I, again, I'm a, the the management of that cow is going to be key, and and not having to even assist a, a calving is is where we should be going for, let alone having a cesarean. I think you know we we need to we need to look after those heifers, maintain body condition quite nicely. What we don't want to do is overfeed either in the run up to bulling, or once she's been bulled in that first winter. You know, let let that cow grow tall. Uh, naturally and, and and with those management decisions but also look at that that carving the birth weight um, you can have bulls that have got that throw small calves with high growth rates you know a big calf does not mean a big a, a big finished animal and similarly a small calf does not mean a small finished animal so use those EVVs and and all of the indexes that's what it's about is, is having those maternal indexes is having an easy carving yeah. with a growth rate yeah I know um Again, when I was on my Nuffield travels, they wouldn't use a bull that weighed any more than 35 kilos at birth on a heifer. And I thought that was a, a good way to, to look at it. Um, would either of you advocate pelvic measuring? Paul, I'll come to you first. Interesting. So a really good friend of mine, Simon Bainbridge, has is, is, is been done a lot of work on that. He's up on Hadrian's Wall. Um, I'm really quite interested in it. I haven't seen enough data to really really make me want to go there with the heritability of the data I want, but I'm really interested. And Simon, who I think is one of the best farmers in the country, really swears by it, him and his vets do. So I think it's something we will incorporate going forward, yeah. 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 So, I, I, you know, what, what we we use is, is we have, weigh all the calves, at birth, so we have a, a birth weight within 24 hours, and we have a, a calving ease score as well. So, um, you know, looking looking at doing a, a measurement is something else to be doing with the cows, and it's it's perhaps not the easiest thing to be measuring. What we end up doing is getting that multiple uh, measure every time that that cow has a calf, so you see whether it was you know whether it just happened to be an easy calf calf that year, or whether you have uh, you know you are breeding for a more easy calving cow in total. Yeah, yeah. But, but like I'm, like you say, but, it's. But yeah. I'm really open to this stuff, eh? You know, and if 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 it, if it's heritable, my guess is, if you going back to you go back into that that cow family that have got nearly half the herd here, I'll bet they're probably big inside. Is my guess. Mm. So as the heritability goes up, but I I I don't see enough merit yet in the heritability of the data. But I'm not. That's not to say that in a year's time we won't be pelvic measuring everything because I I, yeah. I have a lot of respect for the people that are doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like you say, at the moment, it's just maybe another tool in the toolbox to use. Um, but yeah, like you say, the, the more evidence is required. Um, Paul, are you in a TB area? Yes. Yes. How do you manage that then in relation to how many replacement heifers that you keep? So absolutely. So great question. So we're, we're we, um, half the farm has been a coal zone for um, the very first coal zone. So we're into year seven. The other half has been a coal zone for uh, into year four now. Um, so we've got to know the ANSI's and the local constabulary quite well in this this part of the world. Um, it's a it's a real worry for me. It's a real worry. So we're trying to go as closed herd as we can. Hence, we're doing more and more um, embryo transfer work. And actually, we're very lucky. Um, Tyndale Vets at Gloucester now do IVF as well and are getting on really good with that. So we've got cows on program now. I'm going to be as closed as I can. And particularly now I've got so much more choice of sexed male and female semen. We're not, we, I don't think we'll ever be quite a closed herd because I don't mind adding a really good female from a line that we don't have if, if I think the customers need it. But we're going to be as closed as closed as we can. And if the, if the cull works, which it, it appears to be because there are farms around here that have been shut for a long time that are now clear, um, it's key. What it does do, though, it does. We, you won't see me pay top dollar for cows at sales for that reason, because we just can't. I can't justify six, seven, eight, nine thousand pounds on a, a, a bull or a cow in case the worst happens one day. Touch what it doesn't, and um, then then obviously he's thousand and ninety nine quid on the table. I mean, on table valuation, it's just a disaster for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and would and, you but, yeah. would you deliberately you know, keep more heifers in case you lost? some through tb or do you um, not take that yeah into probably although to be fair 
we're really lucky in both the Ags and the Murrays. There's a really nice um, export market for surplus females going to Europe. So okay. in Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, those guys are setting up herd books of both breeds. So any surplus females, we've always had no problem at all selling. Um, at the minute, we're not selling many because we're going up in numbers because we've taken another 50 acres. So we're going to have more cows here. And um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a consideration, Sarah. TB is is my number one worry. So we yeah. kind of we kind of farm expecting to getting it, but hoping the best that we don't. So hence, that's all about valuation and don't spend all your money on one sort of bits and bobs and be as closed as you can, but still open. Too many herds go closed, get yeah. owner's disease, um, think they've got the job sorted and that they always go backwards. Yeah. So yeah. you've got to you've got to keep open minded. And then just the final two questions. Uh, first of all, I'm coming to you, Seth. Um, what breeds crossed makes the best stabiliser cow? What breeds so what is a base cow that you then use? Right. So I mean, the, the stabilizer itself being a composite breed has, has the best of a lot of different breeds into it. Um, if you're starting out, it, the stabilizer will work on on any of your your uh, breeds. You know, but if you wanted to get as close to stabilizer as quickly as possible, um, an Angus or a, uh, Hereford would be a good starting point. Uh, you know, a native type animal would be a good a good starting point to go for. Okay, brilliant. And Paul, the final question: How much creep are you feeding to your calves, and from what age? Yeah, really good question. Depends entirely on grass. At the minute, we've literally started the last last week ten days because um, we've had so much grass. We've had our really beautiful grassy September. And they, they will they they be on about a kilo and a half per head per day at the minute. And we'll probably creep that up to about two, two kilos a head a day, depending on the grass, um, before we take them off. So I'm really interested what the weather does the next week, 10 days. Is the forecast right? Um, I'm interested in nighttime temperature. And also what we've been caught before, um, that, that there's a really good guy called Rob Halliday on um on Twitter, and he talks about it, how you can get caught up with September grass being really foxy, looking better than it is, and actually it, it can really deceive you on a nice sunny September day, and you got grass up to their knees, but it's not it's yeah, not what it quality. appears. So mm -hmm. so we'll creep them up like that. Certainly, I would I would want a meeting at least two kilos and closer to three kilos potentially by weaning when we take them off mums, just to try and stop the shock. And what we usually do, we learn we learn a system where um, Adam Quinney, I learned it from. Um, they'll go in a shed with a creep gate, and our, and they'll do that for about uh, four or five days, and then one day we'll just shut the gate, and we wean them that way. I saw it at Adams. It's so unbelievably simple, and it stops the blaring and the fighting, and it stops that yeah. check and check rates. And then when they've calmed down a bit, um, mums, if the weather conditions are right, will go back out again. Lovely. And somebody just snuck. A very last minute question in. Go if you could that. answer it in 30 seconds, Paul. <laughs> Bit of a challenge. Um, with TB, do you sell your heifers and bulls in bunches to minimise pre-movement testing? Yes. Lovely. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank right. you. You said I got 30 seconds, yeah? <laughs> so just to summarise a bit then, Paul, I'll come to you first. What are your three top tips on setting the foundation for a profitable suckler herd? That is a mouthful. So, and I did write them down so I didn't forget. Number one, buy a good bull with good health status, with good EBVs, and have a look at his mother. Yeah? If you can buy a bull, look at his mum, because his mum will tell you everything. Number two, pay as much attention as you can to the figures, but don't be ruled by them. Still trust your eyes. And keep cows to keep you, not the other way around. Lovely, Seth. So the yeah, the three for me is, is is know what you want to achieve when you when you set out. Uh, look for what goals you want to make. Uh, I would also look at all of the efficiencies of the cows. So all of those different metrics that we've spoken about. And then the final one is, and the most important one is make a plan and stick to it. You're not going to achieve it all in in year one, but if you've got that goal in mind, stay on that same train, and and you will get to those goals by the time those cows enter the herd.
Brilliant. Thank you, both of you. Really appreciate you giving your time up tonight to talk to us. Um, thank you as well to Sarah, who's disappeared off the screen, but um, is doing a lot of work in the background that you just can't see. Um, so just to share what's on my screen at the moment then is if you're after more information um, from AHDB, from technical content, please look at our knowledge library. Um, so the web address is on the screen, but if you Google AHDB knowledge library, it'll give you the same information. If you can't find what you're looking for, please ask somebody. Um, so pick up the phone to your regional representative or whoever you know, and they'll should be able to track it down for you. As far as resources that we think will be useful for you um, due to tonight's conversation, um, we're looking at the Managing Replacement Heifers for Better Returns Manual, which is on there, Breeding Female Replacements for the Suckler Herd and Choosing Bulls for Better Returns, which again, they're all available online and you should, at the end of this webinar, um, get an email with those links in as well. Um, I would also like to flag as of next week, we're starting our strategic, strategic farm month, can't say it, um, and that will be starting um, next week with our Northumberland strategic farm, and they'll be having an event on the 1st of October, looking at getting more from forage, and they'll be every Thursday, there'll be an event from our strategic farms um, running through October. And all our meetings can be found on the HDB events website as well, and you can go on there and book on the same as you have today. Other than that, please do give us your feedback. I think after this, you'll be asked, please do. We can't improve things without you letting us know um, what you liked and didn't like. But other than that, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.